gentleman is Gordon Chang and Canberra by Dr. Leonard Petrov, who lectures at the University of Sydney. Gentlemen, thanks for both for staying with us. Gordon, let, let's talk about North Korea's particular situation in a broader context and how we should be approaching the situation. Before the break, Leonard Petrov uh, was suggesting that it's not really a nation to be feared. What's your response? Dr. Petrov is right that North Korea is a destitute state. It's isolated. It's miserable. You know, on its own, it's not very strong. But North Korea is not just about Korea. You know, North Korea has run a joint missile program with Iran for more than a decade. It sold missile technology to other states as well. And now, what's even worse, it's selling nuclear technology. Uh, it's clearly sold it to the Syrians. The Iranians have been in North Korea and witnessed both of its nuclear detonations. North Korea is selling nuclear technology. This is something which is clearly um, the most destabilizing behavior that one can think of. Okay. And so this is something that is just beyond the Korean peninsula. Leonid Petrov, I mean, there's no doubt that the members of the non-Western club, if I can put it that way, are going to be talking to each other and looking for ways to bolster each other. But does that necessarily make them any more of a threat? Well, they're exchanging secrets with other dangerous states. The North Korea was placed into the axis of evil. So um, exchanging some information or missile technology between the members of this axis, I don't think it's whether it's making it more dangerous or not. But if North Korea was given a chance to do business legally, and uh, trade and cooperate with the rest of the world officially without much sanctions. And still, I remind you that North Korea is subject to numerous and numbers of a uh, variety of uh, sanctions since 1950, when the Korean War started. Then probably North Korea would have uh, thought twice before uh, embarking on this dangerous path. And probably okay. North Korea would have demonstrated uh, much um, economic uh, sort of uh, strategy like uh, South Korea did in 1960s. Gordon Chang, you know, the soft appeasement tit for tat hasn't worked, the hard line threats haven't worked. Isn't it time for something a little bit more conciliatory along the lines of what Dr. Petrov is suggesting? Well, Barack Obama, when he came to office, extended an open hand to the North Korean regime and both publicly and through back channels signaled that he wanted to talk to Pyongyang. So what did Pyongyang do? Well, it launched a long-range missile on April 5. It detonated a nuclear weapon. It renounced the Korean War armistice. It said that it's going to start plutonium production, and you know, on and on and on. This is not the. This is not what a regime is going to do if it wants to talk to you. The the, the response of Kim Jong Il though was not to Barack Obama's election or his new policy. It's been a response more to George Bush and 40 years of policy, isn't it, Dr. Petrov? Yes, I absolutely agree with you. We have lost six or seven years of this uh, futile attempts to push North Korea back to the nuclear corner, to the nuclear abyss since 2002 when North Korea was confronted and basically accused of cheating on the previous 1994 framework agreement. North Korea had no other way or response but just to go nuclear. Um, well, responding to the um, to the point which um, Gordon just mentioned that Barack Obama apparently um, um, you know gave the olive uh, branch to to Pyongyang, I don't, I don't agree with that. Simply because Barack Obama was simply talking about the uh, readiness to discuss and negotiate. Uh, Washington, new Washington administration uh, demonstrated uh, so much neglect and uh, simply. Um, refused to talk bilaterally to Pyongyang. There was only discussions about the resumption of six-party talks, which was another waste of time and efforts and resources, which led us nowhere but to nuclear North Korea. And uh, Barack Obama simply was re uh, appointing, reproducing the worst of Bush administration for the previous eight years in, in, uh, oh, come in on, office. Come so on, Barack come Obama on. has not demonstrated anything new. Stephen Bosworth, the, the Barack Obama's North Korean envoy publicly said a number of occasions, we want to talk to the North Koreans, we'll even talk bilaterally outside of the six-party context. You know, the North Koreans, if they wanted to talk, if they really felt that this is what they wanted to engage the international community, they certainly could have done so, but they didn't. And they have, you know, I think clearly demonstrated that they have chosen a path that is not engagement, that they don't want to talk to the United States or anybody else for that matter about their nuclear program. Leonid Petrov, let me, let me put it this way. It's interesting to speculate a little bit about Barack Obama's policy. Uh, people talk about he wants to talk to North Korea. But it's interesting to think that this 
uh, belligerence from Pyongyang is actually presenting Obama with an interesting opportunity to rebuild some old alliances and to reassert some of its power in North Asia, isn't it? Uh, North Korea is determined to establish good relationship with the United States. They do it their own way. They have uh, in hands a very difficult, complex domestic situation. They have to present their, they have to prove their own legitimacy by creating an enemy overseas. This is what exactly the United States is doing. What the United States Army is doing in South Korea, what the United States is doing in Japan, uh, United States need some sort of enemy, a weak, uh, subdued, but still active, the one enemy which could uh, justify the overspending on military, on uh, missile defense system, on the presence, military presence in the region. So hmm. United States and, the North, and North Korea are doing the same, playing the same game. They are the, they probably are trying to achieve the same purpose, but we cannot compare the power of the United States and the miserable situation of North Korea. Golden so we China, have to be ahead. fair. Well, you know, it, it's very simple. You know, I, I don't see North Korea trying to build the groundwork for discussion. Um, the Obama administration has made it clear, and it's not just towards North Korea, but it's towards other regimes as well, that it wants to have a dialogue with them. And, you know, for all of what people talk about in terms of the Bush administration, the Bush administration spent the time from August 2003 to the end of its term trying to talk to the North Koreans. But the problem is that because of the nature of the regime, which she said, um, this is clearly a, a government that is not prepared at this moment to engage with the international All community. Right. If they would, they would be doing so already. Let's talk a bit about the succession. Leonid Petrov, uh, if, as the reports suggest, uh, Kim Jong-il is on his way out, if I can put it that way, how much of a challenge is the succession going to be? I mean, how do you think the chips will fall after he's gone? Right. Well, Kim Jong-il has three sons. Uh, he has a half-brother, he has his uncle alive, he has a younger sister. Mm, so the question of succession is extremely complex in such a her communist hereditary society like North Korea, where people know nothing about the life of the elite. Uh, whatever is going to be given and represented uh, through the mass media, and there's only like uh, two or three main newspapers on one channel in North Korea. So North Korean uh, population is going to accept whatever they're going to be uh, imposed. Um, so what uh, Kim Jong-il himself thinks is, uh, is another thing. Um, North Korea, well basically Korea uh, as, a, as a whole country, as a society, is a very traditionalist society. The seniority is um, very much valued. So for Kim Jong-il, uh, the potential successor has to be the weakest person in the family. Who is that? The youngest son, Kim Jong-un. Gordon Chang, will this younger son have the legitimacy required to rule? Uh, and are there likely to be other army figures who might take against that and decide that they want to have some more power? I think it depends on how long Kim Jong-il lives. Got to remember that Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il's father, had more than two decades to groom Kim Jong-il to take over. Kim Jong-il has had a much less time, devoted much less time, to making sure that Kim Jong-un, his son, is able, in a position, really, to succeed him. Um, you know, if Kim Jong-il dies quickly, I just don't see an 85-year-old general saluting a 26-year-old kid, especially in a deeply traditional Confucian society. So I think that it really depends on how long Kim Jong-il can exercise or effectively exercise power. And that's all we have time for on this edition of 101 East. My thanks to my guests Gordon Chang and Dr. Leonard Petrov. And from all of us at 101 East, thanks for watching. See you next time.